Welcome to CHI's Unlearning Our Loneliness. We are in week three, and today we'll just be discussing Mary Gateskill's short story, The Sister, or not The Sister, I'm sorry, The Dentist. Last week was The Sister. And we'll also discuss obsession and, and, and ambivalence as part of that. Uh, as a quick review, last week we discussed the importance of space as a necessary precondition for the possibility of allowing love to grow, and then highlighted the importance of fantasy as that which prevents space, but also allows a transition from a narcissistic ingrown love to one that's open to others. So that was kind of the meat of last week's lesson. Uh, this week, uh, we'll examine the space of obsession. But before diving into the story, I'd like to introduce a vocabulary term into the class, which is cathexis. It's a Freudian term, um, and in Freudian psychology, a cathexis is the latching on of libidinal energy onto a particular object. You can cathect onto anything. Babies cathect onto blankets or teddy bears as visceral comforts that replace absent mothers, just as the narrator last week cathected onto Blanca as a love object, even though she happened to not exist. The term cathexis translates the German Besitzung, which means occupation or arrangement, um, either one of those. Uh, it could, the the Zweite Besetzung, for example, can refer to the understudy in a play, right? So it refers to something that can be occupied the way that a role in a, in a performance can be occupied uh, or, or arranged or things like that. So one can connect onto a series of different objects over time, investing them with emotional or libidinal energy, but with an understanding that the objects can and will change um, as, time, as time moves forward. One might, in terms of love, consider these things to be crushes. Uh, people who are thought about in an empty way, without knowledge, and th th that become sort of placeholders for your affection, or one's affection. Um, I think that both Blanca and Victor can be seen as different forms of the narrator's cathexes in last week's story. Uh, but this week we'll focus on the question, how can love emerge from the obsession and through ambivalence, keeping that notion of the cathexis in mind? That's kind of the stakes for tonight's class. Make sense? So, in The Dentist, on page 137, it starts out with a, a beautiful, beautiful paragraph. Uh, Gatesville writes, In Jill's neighborhood, there was a giant billboard advertisement for a perfume called Obsession. It was mounted over the chain grocery store at which she shopped, and so she glanced at it several times a week. It was a close-up black-and-white photograph of an exquisite girl with the fingers of one hand pressed against her open lips. Her eyes were fixated, wounded, deprived. At the same time, her eyes were flat. Her body was slender, almost starved, giving her delicate beauty the strange, arrested sensuality of unsatisfied want. But her fleshy lips and enormous eyes were sumptuously, even grossly, abundant. The photograph loomed over the toiling shoppers like a totem of sexualized pathology, a vision of feeling and unfeeling chafing together. It was a picture made for people who can't bear to feel and yet still need to feel. It was a picture by people sophisticated enough to fetishize, fetishize their disability publicly. It was a very good advertisement for a product called Obsession. <laughs> You've seen these kinds of billboards, I'm assuming, right? Or magazine advertisements or things like that. You, you know that look of that model. I, I think this is a beautifully evocative passage, and its interpretation, the way that Gateskill's just kind of deconstructs what that image looks like is also very good. It's reminiscent of the Socratic definition of love that we covered in the summer class, the conflation of poverty and plenty in one particular site. The image is one of wanting that is intended to make the viewer participate in its want, although what the viewer wants and what the girl wants are likely to differ. The mediations are apt. Feeling and unfeeling people who can't bear to feel but still need to feel, the protagonist, Jill, is experiencing obsession also. Okay, So there's a series of binaries that are constructed about feeling to feel or not feel to want and not want. And that's the preliminary definition that Gateskill gives for obsession. And that's how the story is introduced. That's how the character is introduced. Um, but her obsession is divulged in the next paragraph. And the narrator writes, she had just become obsessed with someone, 
He was a mild, pale, middle-aged man who did not return her ardor, and what should have been a pinprick disappointment had swollen into a great live wound that throbbed at night and deprived her of sleep, of thought, even of normal physical sensation. Gateskill's focus here is on really graphic physical imagery, and it describes an ostensibly psychological problem. It's a pinprick that swells into a throbbing wound. Obsession, from the very beginning of the story, is depravative, right? It's something that, that denotes some sort of a lack. When you're obsessed, it's the awareness of an absence or something that's missing. To be obsessed means to have lost something, even though you can't name the loss or, or, or be able to articulate what that loss means or looks like. Uh, so unlike last week, where space was created through addition, uh, where Victor was gave the narrator something to consider and then gave himself, Jill's obsession arises through deprivation. The, the, the object of her obsession does not return her love or whatever she has. Does that make sense? Okay. Page 138, we're introduced to Pamela, the narrator's friend, who refers to the obsession as too engaged in poverty to give rise to the fulfillment that's, that's present in plenty. And again, those are the Socratic terms of poverty and plenty and how Socrates defined love. It's, it's always mediating between having nothing and having everything. So Pamela says, quote, there wouldn't be any satisfaction for you. It'd be like jerking off forever and not coming. Ironically, the fantasy isn't too small, according to Pamela, but it's too large. Quote, thoughts of the loved one so feverishly inflated her desire that she could not fit it into a fantasy, which she could then make end in the least rote physical satisfaction. As it can be true of love, the obsession has interrupted Jill's normal daily routine. By giving too much, it seems to have deprived her of what she'd be become accustomed to having. So it's a want that doesn't become fulfilled. There's no satisfaction at the end of her desire. It's just this, this ceaseless, throbbing want experienced as a lack. Okay, so far? Okay. So she's obsessed with her dentist, as the title would probably in indicate, and Gateskill provides us with a viewpoint as to how this emerges. The obsession, which I would, I'm also relating to in cathexis, emerges when the dentist removes her wisdom to a story that's recounted in heavily sexualized terminology. So this is how Gateskill describes the event. The dentist had assured her that the ordeal would probably be over in 15 minutes. An hour later, the as yet mercifully unsexualized dentist was still gripping her jaw with enough force, as it turned out, to bruise her, perspiring and even grunting slightly as he tore her tooth out bit by tiny bit. It became almost common, she said later. He kept heaving back, sort of panting with exertion, and he'd say in that voice of inhuman dentist calm, just a little more, we're going to have to move it around in there just a little bit more, and then I think we've got it. <laughs> it got to the point where I could smell him sweating, and a certain indecorous tone crept up under that professional voice, a sort of hysteria straining at the borders. Finally, when he started to give me the speech one last time, I snapped, I just want the fucking thing out, and he started back okay, totally ripping the lid off the calm facade, which is pretty hardcore for a dentist. And that's what got, when you got excited, asked Pamela? No, no. I felt united with him in disbelief and disgust at the whole thing. And again, relate that back to last week's kind of moment of empathy, right? There, there's a united shared feeling. In this case, it's disgust um, and disbelief. But it's still a moment of unity. Uh, but I quote, I'll, I'll get back to the quote, but I was certainly not excited. That didn't happen until later. So in addition to the ordeal, Jill experiences that sense of unity with the dentist even though this unity is anchored in shared negative emotions rather than shared positive ones, right? And, and it both happens. She's not considering the dentist. He's not considering her. Instead, they have this, this notion of disbelief and disgust that they both happen to share in common, right? They both individually feel it, but they also realize that each of them is feeling the same thing relative to the, the, the tooth's extraction. Make sense? Okay. The second step of her obsession comes when the doctor simultaneously relieves her psychological and physiological pain. So the physical pain, uh, there are complications with the tooth. She has allergic reactions to the pain medications. And the doctor provides free medical alternatives. Like he gives her different drugs for free. So that's how he relieves her physical pain. Two, the psychological pain, she's having trouble writing. 
you know, because she's on all these pain meds, her head's kind of loopy, she can't focus, she's in pain. It's just a bad situation for her. And so, and then she starts ex experiencing anxiety about the inability to write, which makes everything all that much more worse. Uh, number three, the pain returns and is redoubled. Quote, there is nothing like physical pain for enlarging and enhancing free-floating emotional pain. So she, in other words, she's in a worse space than she'd been in previously. Number four, the doctor then cares for her physical needs. The doctor's sympathetic and tends to the tooth, saying that he didn't know how she could stand it, given the exposed bone. Jill replies, quote, I can't stand it, she said. She hesitated, fearing that she was perhaps tastelessly spewing into the dentist's vast spaces of professional calm. Then she decided that with all the vastness, he could afford it, and she spewed hard. Uh, what's important here is the way that the rhetoric once again reflects the dance of poverty and plenty. Uh, the language also reverses to traditional sexual depictions. The dentist has vast space that she's allowed to spew hard into, which is a gender inversion of what one more, might normally consider a sexualized description of an account. Interesting. Number five, the dentist then cares for her psychological needs. He loans her a computer to replace her broken word processor and promises to teach her how to use it. Jill, quote, looked into his gray eyes. They were opaque with dutiful kindliness. This is not Fifty Shades of Grey territory that we're entering into. Um, when the dentist first arrives, quote, I felt sort of guarded when he first came in, but I saw right away it wasn't necessary because the dentist had a, quote, combination of beneficence and self-conscious goofiness. Definitely not Christian Grey, right? He's just, a, he's just a guy, just a mild-mannered dentist in the most traditional way. Uh, Gainesville, at this point in the story, intervenes to give the reader a sense of Jill's romantic history. Uh, she moved out at 15 for a three-year affair that resulted, quote, in a state of unfortunate attunement to the kind of refined, convoluted fellow who likes to make a very fancy mess. Thus, her baseline emotional life had consisted mainly of going from one loud mess to the next. This means that the third step in, in the obsession, right? So, he, so the first one, like, he, he, there, there's that shared moment of disgust and second, disbelief. The second one is where he tends to her both physical and psychological needs. The third step is admiration. Quote, the dentist's simple and undemanding generosity looked like a shining piece of integrity, which aroused, aroused first her surprise and then her admiration. Admiration didn't develop into love right away, though. So admiration is the next step. The fourth step, positive identification with the relationship. OK, so it moves from admiration of the dentist as an object to identifying that relationship in a positive manner. She asks if the dentist is happy, and he replies, why wouldn't I be? Uh, the conversation has a profound effect on her. And here again is where I think Gates Gill is at her most interesting. Gates Gill writes, quote, his tone threatened, or his tone seemed to acknowledge all that might threaten happiness, and then to shoulder it aside as if the important thing was to get through life somehow, to extract teeth, to follow the schedule, to do what you said you would do. Jill finished her article quickly and went to bed feeling an unfamiliar species of warmth and comfort. She woke, imagining the dentist holding her from behind, and she prolonged the image, allowing it to become a thought. Right? So now the dentist is not a figure who relieves her needs directly. He's there just kind of in the emotional background of her life, and she feels his presence with her even when she's alone. Fifth step. Fantasy. So it moves from admiration to a positive identification to sheer fantasy. The fact that the dentist remains a cipher, much like Blanca, allows Jill to fixate on him within her imagination. Right? So the shift to fantasy comes with the imagination being stressed over and at the expense of reality. Getting to know the dentist too much at this stage would destroy her imagination of him, and she preferred the imaginary dentist to the real one. Because the imaginary dentist she can have on hand at any time, the real one is a little bit more uh, difficult to get hold of. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's what Gates Gill writes. Quote, the next evening she called the dentist. She pretended to have a question about the computer, and he said, I want you to press Alt. The banality, the politeness, and the harmless hint of command were all accentuated by the abstracted context and took interesting forms in her imagination. Happily, she visualized all, visualized all kinds of things he might want her to do. 
Okay, so she asks for help, he says press alt, but that is, sense of command is all she needs to throw a fantasy wide open and to allow him to lodge more heavily in the imagination than where he had been. Step six. The fantasy leads to her admitting that she wants a relationship. Okay, so as it with, as, as just like what happened with the narrator of last week's story, the sister, the, the movement from fantasy into reality does eventually happen. Here's how Gateskill describes it. Um, quote, she went into sleep imagining that she was leading the dentist up a gentle grassy hill over which a primary colored rainbow stoutly arched. She woke the next day feeling very emotional. She decided she was going after the dentist, whether he was a ridiculous love object or not. She went for a long walk during which she brooded, toiling uphill and down on how to best declare herself. Okay, so there's an, an idyllic moment, she wakes up feeling emotional, and she's going to convert the imagination into reality. Because the imaginary affair doesn't satisfy. And again, it comes back in some ways to this depiction of a deprivative want, which, which mirrors the uh, structure of obsession. Step seven on how to be obsessed. <laughs> Uh, the fantasy becomes anchored in an intellectual encounter that only after transforms into something physical. So it's happening in reality now, but it's primarily mediated intellectually instead of physically. Okay, that's the seventh step. Here's what Gateskill has to say. Quote, she imagined talking with the dentist about the experience. She didn't imagine anything more than a conversation, but she still layered this conversation with the pleasure of understanding and being understood that it became a fantasy of mental sensuality. She and the dentist would rub their brains together. Together, they would pick apart each strand of the model show of compassion and daring juxtaposed with the stripper's humiliation and guts juxtaposed with the customer's bland compulsive staring and the editor's relentless practicality. This, a lot has happened in the story before this point. This is just the next moment. So again, forgive that lack of context, but this is what she's wanting to talk about the dentist with. Uh, I'll go back to the story. Quote, it was a cornucopia of contrasts and bursts of personality and slithering emotional undercurrent from which they could select the strands that made their inmost strands vibrate and hum. And they would feel the vibrating and humming in their voices deep under their ordinary words. For days she cherished this fantasy, even as it faded like a favorite rough spot on the inside of her mouth. Then he called her. Her impulse to vibrate and hum was pretty well exhausted by then, but still his voice aroused it, even though his voice was jocular and empty. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a movement of fantasy. It's still anchored in the mental. She's not willing to go into the physical realm, even in fantasy mode, but that's the direction that she's still inclined toward. Following along? Okay. Eight. The fantasy becomes anchored in distance rather than intimacy, reflecting the initial interaction with the billboard. Here's what, how Gatesville describes it. Quote, That night she thought of the dentist again. She wanted her thoughts to be tender and kind, like they had been the first time she thought of him, but they weren't. Try as she might, she could not imagine him touching her or even being close to her. She couldn't imagine him going away either. Whichever way she turned, his face and his eyes stayed before her, staring with a mask-like fixity that was both intense and detached. Do you see the, the, the allusion back to the billboard? Okay. The image made her both desperate and numb, and under that, other feelings oscillated too rapidly for her to identify them. By the morning, she was sick with the dentist. Grimly, she directed her thoughts at the essay she was supposed to write. But whatever they touched upon, she felt the dentist lurking beneath. And this again was her fantasy, right? That, 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 that he would be underneath her own words. So when she's sitting down to write, she's achieved her fantasy, but she still wants something. But whatever she wants, she's not actually able to go for at the same time. Do you see the paradox? Okay. Go back to the story. Uh, every night during the next week, the dentist stared at her from inside her head. Eventually, she got used to it and slept through it, the way one can learn to sleep through its persistent noise. Any day, she thought, he would call and they would talk, and their words would gradually diffuse the potency of the image. But he didn't call, and his absence polarized his imaginary presence making it both more vague and more powerful so that it seeped through all her thoughts and feelings whether or not she visualized him at night. So the more abstract he becomes, the less real, the more powerful the hold is in the imagination. 
the easier it is to be obsessed. Back to the story. She tried to remember what she had liked about him. She had thought that he was kind and discreet. His kindness still seemed real, but it was mixed with elements she wasn't sure of. His discretion now seemed like a remoteness so intense that it was almost fierce. To receive kindness combined with such a remove was like receiving an anonymous caress while blindfolded. At this point, Gateskill seems to be touching on something true about modern intimacy in general. Although the story is dated, it seems, still seems applicable to the anonymous world of Tinder or Tumblr or OkCupid or whatever other online dating sites one would use. Dating abstractions allows for emotional connections that occur through a distance and a remove. Jill has had a space open to receive kindness, a space that was enlarged through deprivation that the dentist then filled. The way that he fills it, however, lacks the quality that Jill both fears and desires. And this gives birth to an ambivalence about the dentist that keeps her both interested in and distanced from the man. Okay? And just a note on the term ambivalence. Too often it's used as, as a proxy for indifference, but it's not. Ambivalence is not indifference. It's, it's being pulled apart in opposing directions. It's feeling very, very strongly in two opposed ways that can't be reduced one way or the other. Okay, so this is this is what I mean by ambivalence. It's, it's the more technical use of the term. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. She both fears and desires the dentist, and she can't just listen to her fear and let go of the dentist. But she can't give, you know, really pursue her desire because her fears get in the way. And so as soon as she takes a half step forward, it's corrected by a half step back, and she doesn't get anywhere with it. And again, I think this kind of framework is part of what allows and feeds obsession. Make sense? Okay. Step nine, vulnerability. She decides to become open about her past emotional pain and her sexuality, and she tells the dentist both of her being molested and the masturbation that had brought it back to her memory. It's a really, really hard, open, raw wound in Jill's life, and she, she, she just decides to share it and volunteer that to George as a way of doing something, right? And it's not, it's not pursuing desire directly, and it's not listening to fear directly, it's a different path, right? <laughs> and that path of vulnerability goes back to what we talked about with David Foster Wallace in week one. It's, it's becoming considerate, but rather than considering her, hit somebody else's pain, in this case it's the flip side of that, she's becoming vulnerable and open about her own. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean a step forward or a step back, it's a third way out that allows something to happen or something to transpire that doesn't put the impetus on her to make a decision one way or the other. It seems like it's also based on the stage two where he takes care of her physiological and psychological needs. Yeah, because he that's and again that's part of the attraction. She knows that he he was good for it then, and so she feels more comfortable and safe opening up to him now on on a different level entirely. But it's one that nonetheless relates to both the physical and the psychological. All right. Ten. They have a moment of physical intimacy. Quote, he said he had never really thought about her sexually. He said he had to spend a lot of time getting to know a person before he had sex. He said this was all very unexpected and he needed to digest it. She said that if they got to know each other, they probably wouldn't want to have sex. She told him that if she waited to get to know people before having sex, she'd probably still be a virgin. She didn't understand what moved beneath her own words. It seemed too big to be chipped off in word form, but it didn't matter. Right? So again, there, there, what Gatesville illustrates, and kind of throughout the story, this is the third time I think I picked up on it, is that underneath the words, there's something big that disrupts and fragments the, what, what language is trying to articulate. Words can't grasp it, it can't get a hold of it. There's something, there's, there's a point at which language fails, and relative to the dentist, Jill keeps stumbling onto that point. It's bigger than what words allow. Even though she's a writer, she's used to words, she's used to what words can do and how large they can make things, this is something bigger than that. <clears throat> it didn't matter, she kept talking until the dentist stepped forward and embraced her. She closed her eyes and extended her face upward to kiss him. 
There was no sexual feeling in her body, and she didn't feel any in his. That made her want to press against him all the more fiercely, as if she were pinching numb flesh to feel the dull satisfaction of force without effort. And again, that notion of force without effort goes back up to this whole thing, right? It's, it's that same kind of paradoxical quality that she's trapped in and doesn't know how to escape from. <clears throat> then he bent his head and kissed her on the lips. She glimpsed his face. It was infused with tentative lewdness. Just Gatesville's language is amazing, <laughs> just at points like that. Um, a thin shock of sexual feeling flew up her center. It scared her as much as if it had been her, a tongue of flame shooting out of thin air, and she stepped away almost as quickly as he did. She almost said, George, I'm scared, I'm so scared, but she didn't. Here again, Gatesville emphasizes the lack and the deprivation that motivates Jill's desires. She's scared when she senses George's arousal, but she still desires to cause it. In this case, words are as awkward as bodies, right? The, the physical connection displaces both of them. Words can't do it. And, and, and again, I, I would suspect, maybe along with Zach, that really this is not a case of love, right? Because, because both words and bodies seem to push them apart rather than drawing them together the way that love would, would operate. But there's something here that seems suspiciously or uncannily like love. And it's like love enough to supplement love in most of our lives. If you have a good obsession, you don't need to face the fear of loving somebody in an open and vulnerable way. It's, it's close enough. And it's so close that it lets you continue to chase it and avoid ever having to find love in the first place or the second place. It's a loop that protects you from getting what you want. but we still have to go to step 11. After the kiss, Jill understands the paradoxical logic of desire. Quote, Even so he sat, with a little affectation of imbalance, a sensualized shadow of benevolent goofiness passed over his face. It was familiar and dear, this shadow, and she couldn't have it. In truth, she probably didn't even want it, and he probably knew that. It occurred to her that he couldn't have it either, even though it was him. It's a weird passage. What attracts her is what she cannot have and probably doesn't want. George realizes the odd oddity of the relationship, but the it that's there, the centralized benevolent goofiness, is, is something that he couldn't possess because it's him. Right? He experiences it. Other people can see it in him, but it's not that he can have it either. Whatever this it is, whatever this lack is that's attracting her is something that he presents without possessing in itself. You okay with that? Okay. Step 12. Um, step 12 is real intimacy. And it's followed by the erasure of ambivalence and the removal of the cathexis. So here we go. Uh, the scene is the last time Jill sees the dentist. She visits him at the office when his hours are almost done, and he's rushing her away before the security alarms are activated. She asks why he said she wasn't as perverted as, as she thought, which is something that he said early on in the story that's kind of been nagging at her a little bit. And he replies this. I didn't mean anything. I'm a very simple person. I'm bland, and I have a low level of emotional vibrancy, and I like it that way. He rested his wrist free, then frantically fooled with his tie. Why are you always saying these strange things to me? What do you want? Why are you always talking about sex? Our dentist is rather exasperated by this point. Understandably, perhaps, given what Jill has done. Um, Jill says, I'm not talking about sex right now. I, I didn't say you were, but you, you're I'm just trying to be... To her grief, she saw it was true. He was apoplectic with fear. Oh, honey, she thought. Oh, darling. Call me tomorrow, he said thickly. I can't talk anymore now. And for the first time, Jill sees the reality of George's fear. But it becomes an accidentally intimate moment. He's scared at a level that scares her because it's a fear that she also shares. And he, she realizes the reality of his fear without understanding how well it reflects her own. 
they just protect each other from love in different ways. But something, something that motivates her thoughts and them to become more like love than she'd ever imagined occurs at this point. I mean, there's a tenderness in her, oh honey, oh darling, and she's not a tender character. She's a very cold character, right, Zach? I mean, she's very off-putting, very distant. But there's something that's really moving and true about her reaction to his fear. She wants to be able to comfort him, but she can only think it. She can't say it, and her body can't allow that comfort to become physically realized either. Because he's afraid of it at the same time. It's what he desires and what he fears just as much as she does. It's at this moment that the relationship could have begun. Actually, in reality, instead of in, in her head, and who knows what's going on in his head, he, he's, he, he remains opaque throughout most of the story. Um, but Gatesville makes it clear that nothing more could happen. Like, they could have a relationship, but the relationship is already dead before it starts. The fear emerges at a level that leaves George half helpless. It's a level that he can no longer allow his problem-solving know-how to correct. Right? George is good at fixing problems, but this is a problem that paralyzes him. He just reacts to it in a lot more defensive way. Jill's a lot more aggressive, but both of them live with the problem of obsession and desire and ambivalence without ever thinking about it. And when it remains unthought, the problem leads to both of them remaining lonely. So that's the setup that the story offers. Any questions about that so far? Is the first, is it step 12 there, the first time she sees him as flawed, even? I think, so, or sees him as real. And to be real is to be flawed, right? right. But, 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 but it's something that, that prevents her fantasy of him being a cure-all for everything, right? It interrupts that. It, it allows him to become human rather than something just set up on a pedestal to be admired, right? So to that extent, I think flawed. But I don't know that fear is a flaw really at the same time. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, I suppose I have a question about the exact nature of the binary that the dentist represents okay. as far as what what two things are actually being ju juxtaposed in her perception of him. Like there's the more, like there's definitely the more mundane and innocuous part that she sees in him many times. Then there's the part of him that wants to perceive him as sexualized and ultra aggressive even though it's something that she suspects that he hides. Right. So, so part of the quality of the dentist that I haven't gotten into in this reading, like he he's he he filmed strippers for a while. He's worked at the bouncer at a strip club. Like he's done a lot of things that are far more centered and oriented in a sexualized world than what a lot of people do. I mean, and so I think she see she senses in him, but but even that notion of filming things is all, already intimacy to remove, right? I mean, it's, it's always at a remove. And I think she can recognize in him that he has some sort of longing for something outside of himself. I mean, the dentist looks like the narrator of the sister in a lot of ways, right? He looks like he's kind of a self-enclosed, you know, he, he doesn't want anything to interrupt his happiness. And he knows that he is capable of providing a certain amount of happiness to himself that doesn't require anybody outside of him, right? He's self-sufficient the way the last week's narrator was. But, but she can sense a longing underneath that happiness, right? So if this is the extent that, to which he's happy and can be happy on his own, there's, there's also a notion of longing to connect with somebody else in some way. And because it reflects her own longing and her own fear, and, and the fear is also there, right? You know, he's, she has a hard time getting a read on what he wants or who he is because he seems really nice, he seems kind of interested, he doesn't do anything with it. But she also seems interested, doesn't do anything with it. And so I think he, she can understand him as a sort of mirror for her own underthought psyche. Did, did that yeah. explain it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions right now? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go through my implications, right? There's some of the conclusions that I draw from the story, and then I'll open it up for a few more questions. If that's okay? Mm -hmm. right. So implication number one. We're, not, we're out of the steps of obsession. Now we're to the implications. Number one, 
Gain skill seems to model an, uh, or to offer a model for intimacy that follows the notion of space that we developed last week in our conversation about July's story, and one that's rooted in a notion of consideration and compassion that reflects what we discussed with David Foster Wallace's lobster. The major difference is that this story is one of deprivation rather than addition, one that speaks of our tendency to create desires that we do not want to meet, desires that we don't want to have fulfilled. Okay, so, so this story looks at desire as, as, a as an impoverished space. It's a space of poverty that, that, res that resists any of the plenty that comes along with love. It's a way to create a lack within ourselves that we can't not pay attention to, but it's very narcissistic in that way because it keeps circling back on ourselves and it keeps us from ever looking outside of ourselves. And that's the notion of desire that Gateskill sets up. Number two, in some ways, a desire that we don't want fulfilled becomes an operating definition of obsession, which is the space created by the opening image of the billboard. Obsession is filled with poverty and plenty like love, but it's one that denies any sort of fulfillment or integration. Obsession allows our emotional and physical energies to be set at a safe or move, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> relative to an object that we're not actually interested in pursuing. Right? So we can confect on to any object and feel ambivalent about it. Right, because it won't necessarily, we don't know why we want it, we're just kind of locked onto it, and it allows us to spin our wheels, but we wouldn't know what, what to do with it if we got it, right? It's like a, a, a dog that chases cars. You know, if the dog succeeded in getting the car, now what? You don't actually want what you want, you just want to want it, because that allows you to stay in this loop of deprivation. Does that make sense? Number three. The fact that we simultaneously do and do not desire a certain object, or that we're simultaneously drawn to or repulsed by the same person in different ways, leads to ambivalence. We cannot understand our own feelings, and that leads us to a paralysis relative to the relationship. We neither want to be close nor distant, and thus feel eternally restless as a result. Okay, so in, in some ways, if, if if intimacy is, is a connection of where I, words and bodies come together, and this is what love looks like, or something like that, then a space that has no bodies and, and no words, the space of fantasy or, or the insularity of the imagination, this becomes the space of obsession. Does that make sense? A bodies without words is just a, you know, that's kind of casual hookup sex, right? It's, 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 or lust, I mean, however you want to define it. And words without bodies is more of a kind of emotional intimacy. But obsession works so well because it's the logical obverse of what love is. It's eerily similar to the same structure that love has. It's just neither one nor the other instead of both of them in, in a super abundant does that make sense? Okay. Uh, in that case, we'll go to number four. Unlearning our loneliness thus requires that we become mindful of connecting onto the proper object and to learn to recognize ambivalence. Ambivalence and obsession protect us from intimacy and vulnerability. It freezes us from knowing another, and it keeps us locked into an anonymous and ill-fitting world. Perhaps, like Jill, the problem is the conjunction of physical and emotional intimacy, which she both fears and desires, but never manages to put herself in a relationship where it might be found. Right? All of her relationship choices, which also keep her busy, aren't things that are ever going to be fulfilling in any sort of way, and those are the kinds of loud messes that she chases. It allows her to stay focused on herself instead of looking beyond herself. Does that make sense? Number five. Um, I need to mention that the dentist is framed through Jill's interactions with a series of interlocutors to whom she confides her story. The whole story, I mean, it's not really narrated directly. Uh, Jill talks to Pamela, and she talks to Joshua, and she talks to Doreen, 
And she talks to Alex, she talks to Lila, she mentions stuff to her therapist, and she mentions things to others. Right? And, and so the story is retold in her retellings of what happened as she recounts it to all these different people in her world. Although the dentist disturbs her, he also therefore allows her a type of non-sexualized intimacy that keeps her interesting to others without threatening her rather superficial social life. Right? In some ways, he fuels this kind of, uh, of intimate interaction with friends, whoever those friends are. It's all words. There are no bodies involved. Right? It's just social interactions at that level. Because her ambivalence keeps her popular and interesting, she always has another chapter to add to her story. She has very few incentives to shift away from the dentist, right? So if the object, in, in other words, the object in some ways is not the dentist at all. The object that she responds to, this is the object of her obsession. But her more general object of being interesting is acquired at the expense of actually relating to the dentist. Right? As long as she's obsessed with the dentist and has stories to tell about that obsession, everybody will want to talk to her and figure out what's going on now. And that keeps her popular, although it deprives her of that real kind of intimacy. It's a supplement. Right? It's something that she takes instead of going for the real thing. Does that make sense? It makes too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the final point I want to make before uh, opening the questions is this. The whole of the story is saturated with sexualized women who are subjected to violence from men. From the opening photograph onward, there's an emphasis on stories about rape, strippers, pornography, molestation, all sorts of stuff. Gateskill doesn't apologize for this, and she doesn't explain any of this, or this kind of world that she creates for her characters to inhabit. It's simply that every character, every movie, every TV show, Every interaction takes place in a world where women are the objects of cruel male obsessions. Obsessions that are played and replayed remorselessly throughout a variety of cultural objects. This story, which features a woman's obsession with a man who cannot understand it and becomes scared by it, reverses the common cultural codes that we're more familiar with. By doing so, Gateskill is able to complicate the story and show the ambivalence at the heart of it. She suggests, perhaps, that we ingest such narratives and images precisely because it will keep us in our own ambivalent loops of obsession. It becomes a rather frightening portrait of a world in which we hate being lonely, but we fear to confront that which would encourage us to unlearn. And that's how I, I would understand the, the real prominence of very just everywhere, right, Zach? Everywhere anybody looks or sees, it's always a story about somebody being just maliciously harmed in a sexualized way. And it's that's just the world. Any other questions? Jake? Uh, I'm having a tough time wrapping my head around, like, emotional intimacy and the lust on the other side, on the sides of this square. Yeah. Are pretty easily identifiable as not love. Um, yeah. But why is it? It seems like obsession is really like, has to focus really hard on creating and maintaining that distance. And why is it so hard to recognize? Obsession? Yeah. Um, because, because it, it, I mean, the, the, the Pushing away from bodies at the same time as you push away from words allows you to disguise the one for the other, right? And so Jill, when she's pushing away from talking to the dentist, can fantasize about his body. When she's fantasizing about his body, she can like refuse to actually have conversations. And so it allows you to shift from one to the other, right? But never actually acquire either one or the other. And I think that's what makes it hard to recognize. You can keep yourself in this, this space with the appearance of making forward progress that you're never actually making, right? And on the one hand, this emotional intimacy, friendships, you know, things like that, um, you know, that's fine, right? This is safe because you're still physically distanced. This is safe, you know, masturbation can go up here too. Um, you know, as, as, as a sort of physical climax or satisfaction of things that allows things to come to an end, right? That's the termination of the affair. That's the end of it. 
But that has a very clear closure. This has a very clear boundary that's set, right? But this is really tricky to recognize because you can allow something to be at the center of your world that you don't actually want, but you trick yourself into under, away from understanding that you don't actually want to have it. You just want to want it. You don't want fulfillment. You don't want to end loneliness. You want to protect your loneliness as well as you can, which requires some amount of self-deception. Does that make more sense? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So when we're getting to the actual nature of ambivalence, I'm still trying to process what happened at the end of the story. Because it seemed like the two disparate ends of the ambivalence were equally proportional to each other throughout the duration of the entire story. Like when it couldn't have been more obvious that he wasn't sexually interested in her, interested in her that's when she imagined him bursting through her window and commenting to her friends that he was this repressed mm -hmm. sexual pervert. And then in the end, it seemed as though she, she was direct with him and she confronted him and said, why don't you want me? And was that the point where she was able to circumvent that ambivalence? Or how do you actually deconstruct that ending? Um, I think that, I mean, I guess, I mean, like I said, like in some ways the ending is her being taken aback by the, the reality of the compassion that isn't this. And that's what scares both of them in some ways. That doesn't answer your question though. I think the way that what upset her is that she didn't have certainty about the way that George was operating in a bodiless kind of romance. She knew that she wanted and didn't want him in a certain very sexual way, but she had a hard time reading what his indifference toward her body was. And in some ways, part of what she wanted to do is inspire in George the kind of obsession that he had inspired in her, right? And get some parody of the relationship. Because as much as the obsession was very useful to her in engineering and protection from intimacy, she was still powerless relative to him. Right, and if, and if she could allow him to acknowledge that he felt similarly, disinclined to move forward, but still obsessed with her, that would bring more parity to, to the relationship and make it less scary for her. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Because she's not, she, she doesn't, she's not self-aware that this is the actual structure that's motivating her behaviors and actions, right? She just knows that she's obsessed with him and he doesn't, she doesn't know if that's reciprocated. And she wants to be able to have control over somebody's being obsessed with her also in, in a parallel way. Yeah. See, and this thought hadn't occurred to me before, but when you say that, that she wants to sort of incite this reciprocal obsession in him, there's a part of me that makes me think that she contrived the story about being raped when she was young. And one of the emphases of her article was people are inclined to make up these stories yeah. when they can actually. Yeah. Um, or, or she remembers it conveniently or something yeah. like that. Uh -huh. And that's, I mean, that's a totally valid reading of it. You know, that's, at some point, describing whether or not a fictional character, character is motivated to lie or tell the truth with no ability to know one way or the other. It's, it's, I mean, you can debate both ways. And it's not uninteresting, but I don't know. I mean, there's no good answer for it yeah. either. I mean, you can, you can make an argument both ways and there's textual evidence to support both of those conclusions. Other thoughts? Was it interesting? Mm -hmm.